Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. We begin our show tonight with a rather bizarre research project. Now, although the study has been designed to address a very serious problem, we couldn't help but have a little fun with it. So come along as we journey into the eerie darkness where alien creatures rule the night. You can just imagine the rumors this could generate. A distress signal from a downed airplane, a dissident nuclear submarine on the attack, or stranger still, but much more likely of course, evil aliens from another planet landing their starship in the midst of Lake Pondere. <laughs> oh yes, uh, that's been a big concern of ours from the beginning, that people see us out there in the lake flashing lights and kind of wondering what it is we're doing. And Fish and game research biologist Milo Maioli is experimenting with underwater strobe lights to see if they can be used to scare fish away from danger, specifically to keep kokanee salmon in Dwarshack Reservoir away from the deadly turbines of Dwarshack Dam. Over the last 10 years, this reservoir has been known for its kokanee fishing, but that reputation was flushed downriver along with 1.3 million kokanee in the floods of 1996. Kokanee concentrate in the low end of the reservoir, the six miles from the dam up in the wintertime. And when flows out of the dam are high in the winter, high losses of kokanee occur. This was the scenario in late winter of 1996. Ninety percent of the kokanee were lost. Fisheries manager Ed Schriever says that although they plan to stock two million fry or two inch fish, it will take until the year 2000 to recover from the flood of 1996. And that recovery will only happen if no more kokanee wash through the dam in the meantime. In the event that high flows do occur in the winter time when they're concentrated, are there some mechanical devices that we can use to keep the kokanee from actually coming close enough to the openings of the dam and get sucked out? Barrier methods like fish screens or large nets need to be frequently cleaned and repaired. As a result, they tend to be expensive. So scientists are experimenting with strobe lights to see how the kokanee will react to the flashing beams. We lower them down into the lake to where the fish are, we flash the lights and then using our echo sounder go past this boat and see just how far do the fish move away from the lights. The results so of the first few tests have been encouraging. This is the actual echogram. The boat with the strobe lights is located here. Again, the surface of the water, the bottom of the lake. And the strobe lights were right in this position. And in this case, the lights are turned off. Each dot is a fish. They seem to be scattered fairly evenly throughout the area. So then once we started flashing the lights, we noticed a different response of the fish in the lake. Um, the strobe lights are hanging down here. Again, each of the spots is a fish. And what we can see is with the lights flashing, there's no fish on either side of the strobe lights for a distance of, in this case, about 75 feet. Um, in other cases, those fish have moved out to about 100 feet from the lights. You want some help with that or you can get out The strobe light looks like this. Even in daylight, it has a powerful pulse. Um, it looks promising. It's a lot farther than I expected the fish would move away from, from the strobe lights. 100 feet, you figure then you could probably put a strobe light every 50 feet or so across it. Uh, the fish would see the pulsing light and potentially have time to get away from, the, from going into the turbines before the currents are so strong that it just pulls them right into the dam. Most of the fish loss occurs in the dusky hours of early mornings and evenings and during the night. So, as the sunlight begins to fade, the scientists head out. Tonight's research is being conducted on Lake Pend Oreille in Idaho's Panhandle. Tinpore, there's quite a few fish rising on the surface over here, just on our port side. Yeah, they're rising on the surface all around the entire bay. There are a lot of them back there, about halfway between us and the docks. The tests are conducted with two boats. The one with the strobe light remains relatively stationary, drifting with the current. The other boat makes passes as close to the light as possible and then records the fish numbers near the strobe light with a piece of equipment called an echo sounder. Basically, this is just a more sophisticated version of a fish finder often used by anglers. 
Okay, there's a fish right here. See this little dot? Mm -hmm. That's a fish, and it's 12 meters deep, and it's a minus 56 or 57 dB, and that'll be about uh, three quarters of an inch. So it's just a teeny little fish down That's there. Thick enough. Yeah. This has the capability of detecting a fish one inch down to 900 meters. Mm -hmm. So it's a very powerful system. The first few passes are conducted with the strobe off. This gives the researchers a recording of the number of fish loafing near the darkened light. This is their control group. After the third pass, the strobe light is activated. You want us to dock up with you? No! Just put the light down 10 feet! Uh, the boat's been flashing now for about eight minutes or so, and we'll come right past the lights, and we'll see if the fish thin out as we get closer to the lights. Many of the fish are this year's offspring, an inch or so in length, so it may take some time for them to swim out of the beam of the strobe light. Yeah, this is the light, the flashing lights that we just went past. Um, the area around it, particularly above it, is clear of fish, but it looks like we have a bunch of fish down below it more, if maybe the shadow of the light is keeping the fish underneath it. It's destined to be a long, tedious night, and there will be many more long nights to follow, repeating the same slow process of collecting data. But that's the nature of research in any field, whether it's physics, human medicine, or wildlife biology. It is a meticulous, precise, and incredibly time-consuming process, and sometimes the conclusions are discouraging. But so far on this strobe light study, even the skeptical scientist Milo Maioli is optimistic. They seem to move back almost 100 feet, so that's pretty good. Yeah, and, and that, when we start talking about being able to move fish 100 feet, that, that makes it pretty promising that it may work on the dam. So next time you see an eerie greenish light flashing erratically, you may want to investigate before calling the authorities. It may be this research project, but then again, of course, it could be an alien starship. Who knows? I'm very fortunate that we have time for a long-lived fish like this to recover this population. Further up Idaho's panhandle near the Canadian border, another research project is being conducted on an endangered fish. No flashing lights this time and no sign of evil aliens, but the fish itself is somewhat of a mystery. This is the Kootenai River, deep and tranquil. It winds slowly along, bending and twisting into long curves that seem to go on forever. But deep beneath its placid surface lurks a secretive dinosaur, the Kootenai white sturgeon. Well, they're kind of neat. They're very primitive, uh, very unusual fish. They live uh, to be 45, 50, 60 years old, and we're very fortunate that we have time for a long-lived fish like this to recover this population. Had they had a shorter lifespan, we may not have white sturgeon in this river anymore. The population is made up primarily of older fish. Since Libby Dam was completed upriver in 1972, there's been very little sign of reproduction. As a result, the Kootenai white sturgeon was listed as an endangered species in 1994. Do we have an antenna for the radio? You guys have a buoy hook in there? Now a recovery team made up of scientists from Canada, the United States, and the Kootenai tribe are working together to try and restore the population. First I want to grab the lower downstream buoy and then just start pulling the line. It's attached to an anchor, has a line going across the bottom of the river to another anchor and hooks between the anchors. Then that our anchors attached to the buoy you see up there. Well, hopefully there's a fish somewhere in between. Fisheries biologist Vint Whitman is going to get skunked today. Don't feel anything pulling. But they've had good luck in the past. In fact, the recovery team has captured over 80 different sturgeon and fitted them with transmitters like these. Let's see, we've got uh, two different transmitters. This is a sonic transmitter. And this is a radio transmitter. Hi, guy. 
Each captured sturgeon is measured and weighed. A small incision is made in the abdomen to determine the sex and whether it's about to spawn. Then the fish is released. The two transmitters allow biologists to track their movements both by air and underwater. So right now it can pick up a fish 2353. Three. You can hear series two beeps, pause, five, three beeps, pause, five beeps, pause, and you need a long pause, and then it just keeps repeating over and over. The sonar is difficult to hear in fast moving water. That's where the radio transmitter comes in. In addition to this mobile unit, there's two fixed radio receivers located along the riverbank that record the date, time, and transmitter number when a fish passes by. All this data is being collected to determine the optimum conditions necessary for the Kootenai white sturgeon to successfully spawn and rear young fish. And we're getting ready to pull an egg net. It's just about, it's a two by three metal frame with an anchor on it with, has a furnace filter material in it. And then when the eggs settle, they collect on the furnace material. The eggs are fairly adhesive. Over 70 of these egg mats are strewn along the river bottom in different types of habitat. They are checked daily to see what kind of conditions the spawning sturgeon prefer. Do they choose sandy areas or cobbles? How deep is the water and how warm? What's the velocity of the river current? Once the biologists learn the secrets of these big fish, they can design a plan for preserving them. So in the future, beneath the tranquil waters of the Kootenai River, there will always be a home for this mysterious dinosaur of the deep. Well, I think it's important that we have a measure of the quality of life. And Kootenai River white sturgeon once provided an excellent fishery in this river, as did a number of other fish populations, like the burbot. And when we uh, lose uh, critters like the white sturgeon, we lose burbot, we lose recreational value, we lose intangible values that are important to the quality of life. What better way to watch wildlife in Idaho's Panhandle Lake Country than by water? Outfitter Josie Merithew calls it Goat and Boat. It's a unique arrangement she's dreamed up to allow people to view Idaho's majestic mountain goats from the perspective of, believe it or not, a kayak. Don't let the rain stop you. After all, this is North Idaho. Besides, today's goat and boat trip includes a cruise on the good ship Shanadis, a warm, dry voyage down the length of Lake Ponderé. The boat is a classically designed vessel that invites comparisons to the proud old tugboats of the past. She cuts through the water gracefully, pulling up alongside the pier and our family of novice kayakers. The guy in the green raincoat is Phil Cooper. He's with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. We brought him along to tell us about the goats we're going to see. Anyway, that's what we told him. In reality, we were hoping he'd bring his wife, Kathy, and their three boys. Introducing kids to the wonders of wildlife watching is half the fun. That's Daniel waving at us. At nine, he's the oldest and big enough to be captain of his own kayak. The little guy in the red jacket is five-year-old Ben. He's the ham of the family and, as you'll see, not at all shy of the camera. We're going to tow them, and uh, then we're going to go over and pick up the raft. We don't have very many boats today, but sometimes we have as many as 15 boats. In the Seven-year-old Michael Cooper seems a bit more bashful. He's often off exploring on his own. There you go. The 40-foot boat is beautifully designed. Owner and captain Curtis Pearson did most of the work himself, and it shows in the attention to detail. And for the three curious boys, it's a big adventure ship just waiting to be explored. How do you get in the valley to put the boat? Well, come here and I'll show you. Guests are welcomed by the captain's wife and partner, first mate Linda Mitchell. That is an emergency exit. Very good. If something were to ever happen, which we don't think that it would, but if it did, that's a way to get out of the boat. We open that 
catch right there. And I'll show you later how that's done. Is this the longest one? Topside, the kayaks have all been secured. They trail out behind the boat in a long, colorful row. And we're off. On the bridge, Captain Curtis guides the boat carefully out into the open water. A light, steady rain continues to fall, but it doesn't hamper the view of Lake Pend Oreille. It's a spectacular sight, with low clouds swallowing the tops of the mountains and reflecting in the gray waters. It's even better viewed from the cozy, mahogany-paneled comfort of the bridge. I always thought if I could stay warm and dry, you can have a good, you know, you can have a good day. And uh, I guess that's the hardest thing you can convince people that they can stay warm and dry. It's just under a two-hour cruise to our destination, and in the warm, dry cabin below, yeah, yeah. the Cooper kids are busy right, charting exactly the course. And where we're going today is a place called Bernard Peak, which is at the very south end of the lake. And when we get there, this is where Bernard Peak is, we're going to see all along in here, hopefully we're going to see some mountain goats. Well, that seems easy enough. Simply head south. Move over, Captain Curtis. This is a job for a seven-year-old. So you pick that spot. Pick a spot on the ground, on, on the cliff, and you head straight for it. The same spot all the time. You got a spot? Bernard Peak looms straight ahead, and suddenly all hands are on deck, peering through binoculars, searching for the first sign of goats. See that white line, kind of? That's a mama goat and a baby goat laying down. Uh, they're just snoozing up there. The goats are descendants of animals transplanted here in the early 1960s. Although this is not historic mountain goat habitat, the animals seem to have done quite well. We don't have any real traditional summer habitat here. This is really low elevation, very atypical habitat for mountain goats, and that's really why they, they didn't occur here naturally. In the heat of summer, the goats try and escape the warmth by hiding beneath overhanging rocks. But on a day like today, they're clearly visible as they trot along the trails. This is an unhunted population primarily because it is a popular wildlife viewing opportunity for folks. Uh, people have observed as many as 25 to 30 goats at one time up on the hillside certain times of the day. The big slide on the white side of like two little chocolate dots laying down. Okay. There'll be like two patches of snow and there'll be them laying down. As a teacher, Ben's mom, Kathy, sees more to this trip than just a fun outing for the kids. It's an education. Um, it's so important for them to experience wildlife instead of just reading about it. And it's so impressionable on them. They take it back to the classroom and they can write about it. They can tell about it. Um, so much more potent than just standing up and giving a report from material that they've read. I'm ready to kayak. OK, boys, listen up. Good. Okay, we're not going to go too far. We're just going to cruise along the coastline and see if we can get up a little closer to see the goats. It's the first time kayaking for the whole family, but that doesn't daunt outfitter Josie Merrithew. Most of her novice clients are amazed at how comfortable they feel after a few basic tips, especially kids. They're really stable, but you can do this with your hips in your kayak, and it's just going to stay right there with your hips. Okay, here's your paddle. Have you paddled before? No. Oh, kids do great. They're actually um, easier first-time paddlers than adults. Once you give them a little education, they get over their, their little bit of tension that they have, they just take right to it. We have them standing up and tipping them over and climbing back in. They, they just love it. Even little Ben gives it a go. Power paddling is that around in their double kayak. But most impressive is nine-year-old Daniel, who takes to paddling like the proverbial duck to water. You having fun? Yeah. It has all the elements of a great day in the outdoors. Fresh air, exercise, wildlife watching, and then the warm, dry haven of the good ship Shonadis when it's over. Are you cold? 
it really expands our horizons in terms of trips. So someone coming along has the best of both worlds. They get to go on a classic boat tour of the lake, and then they get to slip off into a little kayak and be the captain of their own boat. Unusual fish. They live uh, to be 45, 50, 60 years old. And we're very fortunate. We'll close our show tonight with a creature feature, profiling that dinosaur of the deep, the white sturgeon. Here in Idaho, the ancient white sturgeon still cruises slowly up and down our rivers. Not much change from the primitive reptiles that spawned it. For thousands of years, there was no need for the sturgeon to evolve. They had developed to a point where they were a successful species. The large, slow-moving beasts could live to be 100 years old and grow to an excess of 15 feet. But the last century has seen a sharp decline in Idaho sturgeon populations. Damming the rivers is one factor, but overfishing, too, contributed to the sturgeon's demise. These days, a 10-foot sturgeon is a rare catch, but that doesn't dampen the enthusiasm of anglers. Although it is a strictly catch and release fishery, battling with the big ones is an adventure you, not I've to be missed. A lot of time fishing for sturgeon. This is the first time we ever caught two at once. We're gonna need two ropes, Luke. We're gonna have to a rope on each side. Grab the line, Luke. 